Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. If you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in and get in on this good hour. I feel like we can be an inspiration to them. You'll be doing them a great favor. So you do that today, and we appreciate it so very much. Take your Bible and turn, will you please, to the book of Exodus chapter 2. I'm speaking to you on this subject. The man who failed to look up. The man who failed to look up. This will be tape number 227. Now we'll send these tape out to you for a gift of $3 of each tape. And that the gift is used to help take care of our radio expense. So I hope that you'll write to me and stand by this home mission work. My mail's been great law for the past few weeks, and I hope that you'll pray for me and write to me. And my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. You know, Baptist people sometimes are pretty stubborn. I'm reminded of the mother that spanked a little boy real good and he left, went into the other room. He was gone a few minutes and he came back. And she said, what were you doing in there? He said, well, I pit on your coat and I pit on your dress and I pit on your shoes. I'm waiting now for some more pit. And so he wasn't going to give up. He meant business, I reckon. Now God's people need to stand and stay put and be aggressive and determined by the grace of God to get things accomplished for the Lord. Now, in the book of Exodus, chapter 2, I want to read a verse of Scripture. And I'll only read maybe just two or three verses. Look at verse 11, at Exodus 2, 11, page 72 in the original Scofield Reference Bible. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren, and he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy feller? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely, this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Look at verse 12 for my text. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now here we find a mighty man by the name of Moses. God's choice leader, God's commander, to lead his people out of the land of uh, Egypt. Now he knew that he was to do this job, but he couldn't understand why. He didn't get much cooperation. And one day he saw an Egyptian fighting out there, one of the Hebrews, and he killed that Egyptian. And instead of looking up, he looked around him. He looked, no doubt, east, west, north, and south. And he saw nobody that could see what he was doing. And he killed that Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Evidently, he didn't bear him very well. He probably left a toe sticking out or his nose or something because they discovered what he had done. And then he found out the people knew and he had to flee for his life. Now, if he had looked up, instead of looking around him, he might not have killed that Egyptian. But he looked around him, he failed to look up, and it got him into trouble. He had to flee the land of Egypt, and for 40 years, he was in Midian, there in the desert, caring for his father-in-law's sheep because of what he had done. He knew Pharaoh was after his life, and he had to remain there until God decided to send him back into the land of Egypt. Now, Moses is a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ in several different ways. Number one, in that he was a goodly child. Moses, when he was born, was a goodly child. He was a fair child. 
And so was the Lord Jesus Christ when he was born. Secondly, he had an attack on his life when he was just a child. They had to hide him three months to keep the soldiers from putting him to death when he was just an infant. So did Jesus have an attack up on his life. And what Jews that would believe there as he called out a people for his name. So Moses seeking out a Gentile bride, his type of Christ calling out from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And then number six, his people received him at his second uh, coming. That is when Moses came back to Egypt for the second time, when he came back where he had been uh, previously, there they received him and he led them out. Now, although the Jews rejected Jesus the first time he came, when he comes a second time, they will receive him and, of course, bow down to him and admit they were wrong and he'll save a nation in a day. And then Moses became a mighty ruler. And so will the Lord Jesus Christ become a ruler and he'll rule with a rod of iron during the millennium. In these seven ways, you find that Moses was a type of Jesus Christ. I only mentioned seven. There's many, many ways in which he was a type of Jesus. Now notice, when you please, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now Pharaoh's daughter discovered him in a little ark of bulrush, and there she took him for her own, but he absolutely refused to be called her son. She wanted him to be her son, her adopted son. He, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, he would not bow down to her commands and wishes. He wanted to do that which was right. He wanted to obey God. And what God wanted him to do, that he wanted to do. We have too many sons of Pharaoh's daughters today in the ministry. They want to bow down to the hierarchy. They want to do what the ecclesiastical daddies want them to do. They want to make a good report at the associational meeting or the conventional meeting. And they want to please man and the overseers more than God. Now we have too many of Pharaoh's son, daughter's sons today in the ministry. Highlands, compromisers, those that seek to please man instead of God. Now a preacher that's called of God to preach, he's to please God first of all. If man like it all right, if he doesn't like it all right, he's to please God and preach the word of God. Number three, he chose to suffer affliction with God's people. Now Moses had it made there in Pharaoh's palace. He had access to all the wealth and privileges and luxury of Egypt. He was trained in the military field. He was a great commander. No doubt he fought many battles, conquered the countries. And he was a mighty leader, great man. But you know, as he looked out upon his people, the Hebrews, and saw them suffering... They were laboring every day to try to fight for a living, get a little bread from the soil. And he saw how they were persecuted. He saw how they were afflicted. And his heart went out to them. And Moses said, I'd rather step down out of Pharaoh's palace and suffer with God's people, my people, God's people, than to have the privileges and the luxuries of a life here in the palace. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now there's pleasure in sin, no doubt about that, but it's only for a season. It's not indefinite, it doesn't last forever. It'll soon end, and you pay the consequences. And Moses knew that. And he knew then that he could enjoy pleasure. He had money at will, he had anything his heart designed there in the palace of Pharaoh. And he knew that he really had it made. But Moses said, I'd rather step down, turn my back upon the wealth of this world, and go with God's people and consider the reward on the other side rather than to have it down here. And he made that decision. And many times you as a child of God, you have to do likewise. There's many things you might get enjoy down here that would be much better for you if you go along much easier for you, but you must consider life after death. You must consider a payday someday. You must consider there's a time coming when God will scrutinize your labors 
and rewards you accordingly. You must keep that in mind. Now there's a negative and positive side to uh, serving God, if uh, faith that we see it here uh, activated in the life of Moses. And there's a refusing and a choosing. Now Moses, first of all, refused the legends of Egypt and chose to walk with God's people. Then there's a ceasing to do evil and a learning to do well. You'll find that in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Cease to do evil and learn to do well. There's a ceasing of doing evil for the people of God and the doing well for God. Number three, there's a hating the evil and loving the good. Amos chapter 5 and verse 15. The Bible says hate the evil and love the good. That's the way God wants his people to do. Number four, there's a confessing and forsaking of sin before there is mercy. Read Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. God said if we confess and forsake our sins, then he'll have mercy upon us. That must take place. Number five, the prodigal leaves the far country and then he goes to the father's house. Now he couldn't go to the father's house while in the faraway country. He had to leave the hog pen. He had to leave the faraway land. And then when he left the faraway land, then he went back to the father's house. Now you can't enjoy the father's house and enjoy the hog pen all at the same time. You must realize that. Number six, a sinner must abandon his idols before he can take up the cross and follow Jesus. We find the Bible tells us we must leave the idols of this world, then take up our cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ must be first in our lives. First of all, or not at all. We need to realize that when Jesus was talking to his people about discipleship, some said, me first, me first, let me go bury my father, let me go tell the people the good about him, let me do this, and then I'll follow you. Jesus said, no, sir, I want to be first. Jesus Christ should come first in your life before a mother, daddy, wife, husband, or children. If you don't put God first, you put him second, and that grieves the Spirit of God. There's nothing in this world that should stand between you and God. If you belong to God, if you love the Lord, I don't care what it is. You have people there, they'll put their families between them and God, and that's wrong. You idolize your family when you do that. You make an idol out of your family. And God can very easily take that family away from you. Don't make an idol out of your husband or your wife or your children or your mother and dad and let them come between you and God and God's work. God can very easily take that idol out of your way that he might have your heart and your best and be number one in your life. Now you remember that. There must be a turning to God from idols and serving the living God. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. The heart must turn its back from the world before it can receive Christ as Lord and Savior. He cannot be and will not be your Lord and Savior until you turn your back upon the world. Now let's move on and notice another thought, number four. We find that this man, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. Now the reproach of Christ. Now consider that. That is a reproach of Christ if you serve him. Would you be willing to esteem the reproach of Christ greater than the riches and pleasure of this world? It'll cost you something to serve God. That's a reproach in serving God. The Bible says suffer for him without the gate. Or had you rather go ahead and love the world and serve the world and not stand for God? Remember you must face the Lord. That's a payday someday. Now what makes people give up in this country to go to a faraway land as missionaries? We have men and women today. We have missionaries supported by this church. And we thank God for the privilege serving on foreign soil. What makes these people willing to leave a country like America and go to India or Africa or China or South America and they live among the the heathen people, as it were, and live in poverty and suffer, what makes them willing to do that? Only the call of God. They'd rather go and suffer with those poor heathen people and tell them about Jesus than to have the luxuries, the easy life here in America. It has to be a call from God. 
God must call a missionary to be a missionary or he's not worth a dime on the foreign field. You must remember that. Yonder in England many years ago, there's a man by the name of Henry Martin. Henry Martin was a brilliant man. They looked at him as maybe one day to be a member of parliament or maybe the prime minister. God saved Henry Martin and he was in love with a beautiful young lady by the name of Lydia. And one day God called him. God said, Henry, I want you to go to India. I want you to give up that beautiful girl, Linda, or Lydia rather, and go to India. And so they found in his diary these words. I love you, Lydia. Goodbye, goodbye. I must put God first and serve God. Goodbye, Lydia. I love you very much. I must go to India. That man went to India and spent many years there and founded a great mission there in India that's still in operation today. They contracted a terrible fever after serving many years, leaving the girl he loved with all of his heart and going back to going to India to serve God whom he loved more than he loved her. And then after contracting the disease, they put him aboard a ship to send him back to England. On the way to England, his fever was so high they had to take him off of the boat and carry him out on the sand of the seashore. And he said, give me my Bible, please. He was lying there on the wet sand. They gave Henry Martin his Bible. And his eyes are so bleary, his fever so high, until he couldn't read it. He turned over on his stomach and dug a hole in the wet sand and buried his face in the sand and went on home to be with God. What made that man sacrifice a lovely, beautiful young girl that he loved? Leave the land of England, go to India and preach the gospel to those heathen over there. Why? What made him do it? He'd rather suffer serving God than to have the luxuries and the ease of this life because he considered that's coming a payday someday. Moses had respect and the recompense and reward. Hebrews eleven twenty six. For had respect and the recompense and reward. He knew that's coming a time. When God, when you stand before God, oh, we're so oblivious to the obvious until we don't realize that's coming that time when we must stand before God. It's a point on the men wants to die and after that the judgment. You heard the story of Dr. Marson. Dr. Marson was a great missionary, spent many years, I believe 40 years in Africa, among the hot and tots there in Africa telling them about Jesus. Teddy Roosevelt went over there hunting game and spent some time hunting game in Africa. Time came for Dr. Marson to come back to the state. Been away for 40 years. He aborted the ship and came back to America. He didn't know Teddy Roosevelt had been over there hunting game and was on that same ship coming back home. He didn't know that. When they arrived at Port in New York, he heard a band out there playing. Oh, he said, uh, I know they appreciate me and my 40 years of service in Africa. They have arranged a, a band to meet me when I get off of this ship. But he was surprised when he came off of that boat. That band was not for him. They were playing for Teddy Roosevelt. He had been over there shooting game and having a good time. It wasn't for the missionary that had spent 40 years there in the jungles of Africa. Now Dr. Marson dropped his head with a heavy heart. There wasn't one soul there to meet him. Not one. He went and got on the train and he went to his hometown. He thought, now when I get to my hometown, the neighbors and my friends will be out there to meet me and they appreciate the 40 years I've spent in Africa. When he arrived there at the depot, they got off the train. The only person out there to meet him was a black man in a buggy that sent him there to pick up Dr. Marson. He called in that buggy with a broken heart. He said, they don't appreciate me coming back home. They don't appreciate what I've done in Africa. They don't appreciate my 40 years there trying to win the heathen to God. They didn't even appreciate me coming back home. He dropped his head, tears in his eyes, and God spoke to him. And God said, son, son, cheer up. You're not home yet. Oh, beloved, for the child of God, our home is on the other side. Down here we have our difficulties. We meet with disappointments. We meet with heartaches, misunderstandings. We're sick in body. We're troubled. Many times we can't understand it. We're perplexed. But remember, children, we are not home yet. This world is not my home. When they were singing that song about come spring, I thought about my precious mother 
Who's in heaven today? Some of you have a mother in heaven. I saw tears in your eyes and you sang that song as you thought about your mother that's in heaven. My little mother, when I went to pay her a visit, she'd be sitting there and she'd see me coming. She'd begin to clap her hands. I'd say, Mama, how are you doing? She said, Son, I'm doing just fine. Doing just fine, so I'm happy. Hallelujah, she said, praise the Lord. She said, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I said, that's right, Mama. I know you're suffering. I know you're confined now. But this world is not your home. She said, that's right, son. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. She'd pat her hands together and she'd say, son, I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to get that gospel out, son. I can't preach, but I sure pray for you. And stand by you as you preach. I said, Mama, by the grace and help of Almighty God, I'll preach this gospel. My precious mother stood by me as long as she lived. From the time God saved me until she went home to be with God. She faithfully stood by me like Mary standing by the cross of Jesus when he was crucified. My mother did exactly that. And I thank God for the precious memories of that precious soul who's now gone in the place where she said, the world is not my home. My home is beyond the blue. And that's where she is today. And I'm looking forward to seeing her. This is not our home. We're just passing through down here. We find by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. The old king hated him and wanted to kill him. But he said, I'm going to fear God, not the king. We must obey God. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured to seeing him as invisible. Hebrews eleven twenty seven. He said, I don't care. I don't care what the king says about it. I'll serve God and I'll do right. And that should be your attitude today, regardless of what this world might think about you. He feared God more than he feared man. He refused to compromise with Pharaoh. He said, now I'm not going to compromise with Pharaoh. When he went back to lead God's people out, old Pharaoh said, Moses... I'll tell you what you do if you're going to lead your people out of here. You just go ahead and, and worship right here in the land. You don't have to lead them out of the land of Egypt. You can worship God here in the land. That's what the devil tells every Christian. You don't have to give up the world. You can still live like the world, act like the world, smell like the world, do what the world does. You don't have to give up the world, the devil tells you. But Moses said, no, sir. No, sir, we're going to give up Egypt. We're giving up the world. Pharaoh said, all right then, if you're going to do that, in Exodus 8, 25, he said, don't go very far away. Just If you've got to have your people worship God, just go a short way. That's what the devil tells you. Don't go all out for God. The devil tells you, you don't have to go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Just go kind of have, drop in on Sunday morning if, if you feel like it, if you don't sit at home. That's what the devil tells you. And there's a lot of church members sitting at home this morning because that's what the devil told them. They didn't need to come to church today. But Moses said, no, sir, I'm not going to do that. I'm going all the way. Pharaoh said, don't go very far. Don't go all the way. No, I'm going all the way with God, Moses said. And, and then Pharaoh said, all right, now I'll tell you what. If you determine to take your people to worship God, just you men go and serve God. Exodus chapter 10 and verse 11. Just you men go. You don't have to take your wife and children. Just you men go. You have a lot of that taking place today. Maybe just a husband goes to church, leave the wife and children at home. That's not right. Wouldn't you like for your whole family to go serve God with you and go to heaven with you? Well, he said, yes, you men. Go. No, and Moses said, no, sir. No, sir. We're going to take our wives and our children with us when we serve God. All right, Pharaoh said, Moses, I'll tell you what. If you're going to do that, leave your flocks and your herd behind. Exodus chapter 10 and verse 24. And then Moses said, no, sir. We're not going to leave one who. We're going to take our flocks, our herds, our goats, our cattle. We're going to take everything with us. In other words, the devil says, now you can go to church, but leave your pocketbook at home. You can go to church and serve God. You can sing and you can enjoy the service, but don't help out financially. Let somebody else do that. You just go ahead and keep yours and let somebody else pay you away and pay your bills. Man, I do that walk into a cafe. And let somebody else pay for his lunch and never pull his pocketbook out if you can get away with it. But let me listen. Every child of God should be willing to do his part financially, take his pocketbook with him whenever he serves God, do his part financially in taking care of the work of God because God depends upon his children to do that. 
Moses said, we're not going to leave a hoof behind. We're going to take our wives, our children. We're going to take our cattle, our goats, our sheep. We're going to take everything we have, Pharaoh. We're not going to leave a thing here in the land of Egypt. And Moses refused to compromise. Now, if the devil can get you to compromise, go part of the way, not go all out for God, not do what you should, that's exactly what he do. And he's robbing you. And you'll be sorry when you come to the end of life's journey. Finally, through faith, he kept the Passover. The Bible said in Hebrews 11, 28, Pharaoh, through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, Moses said, we're going to serve God, deserve the Passover. They cross over the Red Sea. They went in the wilderness. They erected the tabernacle. They met with God. God met with them. And Moses obeyed the Lord. He was the man that made the mistake at one time by looking around him and not looking up. But God forgave him for that. And he became a mighty, mighty warrior for God. Beloved, you need to look up. The devil may wall you around, but you need to look up. He can't cover you over. You can pray and talk to God. And don't let the devil defeat you. Moses spent 40 years in Pharaoh's palace learning something. And then he spent 40 years in the desert learning that he was nothing himself, read it. And then he spent 40 years in the wilderness learning that God is everything. Moses lived to be 120 years old. And the Bible said when he was 120, his eyesight was just as good and he was just as strong physically as he was when he was 40. God is able to sustain you and give you strength. If he wants to do so, he can do it. And Moses served God faithfully. But did you know Moses did not become a leader of God's people until he was 80 years old? That old gray-headed man at the age of 80 took over the pasture of more of a million people, became their pastor, their leader, and their commander, and led them through the wilderness. And there became a mighty leader for 40 years. He pastored that group. He became discouraged at times. God said, I'm going to kill that chair. I'm going to kill those people. Moses said, no, let them live, Lord. Let them live. And Moses even wanted to die at times. But God gave him grace and strength. He became discouraged at times, but God stood with him. And he was a mighty leader for God. In 40 long years, he served God's people from 80 to 120. You have a crazy idea today among a lot of people. When a preacher gets old and gray-headed, they say, well, let's sing the song now. Get away, old man, get away. Beloved, that's wrong. The longer a man serves God in the ministry, the greater he has become. The more he studies God's word, the more he prays, the more qualified he should be to be able to lead God's people. That's a place for the old man. That's a place for the middle-aged man. And that's a place for the young man in the ministry of God. Just because a preacher is old, that doesn't mean he can't serve God. He can serve God till he dies. If he wants to, he might not be strong enough to pastor a church or go full time in a evangelism or go to the mission field, but he can do what he can do as long as he lives. Somebody asked me some time ago, said, preacher, you're going to re retire. I said, no, I'm fixing to refire. Beloved, I don't believe in retiring. I'll never retire as long as I can breathe. I'll preach as long as I can preach. I'll bite the devil as long as I can bite him. I and mean, when I lose my teeth, I'll gum him until God takes me out of the world. I don't intend to give up. I'm going to keep on keeping on the glory of God. There may come a time when I won't be able to pastor church because of responsibility. There may be a time when I won't be able to travel many miles of evangelism. I know there wouldn't be a time I could go to the mission field, but there's always something I could do to serve the Lord. Beloved, there's something you can do. You don't get too old to serve God. You live to be a hundred. You can still serve the Lord. So take courage. There's no quitting. There's no stopping. There's no letting up in the matter of serving God. Moses, lead my people out. You're 80 years old. That's all right. I'll be with you. And for 40 more years, he led God's people. At the age of 120, he died and not a soul attended his funeral. He had millions of friends but not a soul would tend his funeral. God is the only one. And God buried him. And nobody ever knew where God buried him. God buried Moses. God took care of his servant. And God will take care of you. 
Don't just look this way and look that way and look behind you and in front of you like Moses did. Look up because the one that's going to see you through is the one that's above. Amen. God bless you. You listen well. Stand to your feet. Our Father, I pray now in Jesus' name that you'll take the message and use it. Help us to look up, not just around us, but look up. Father, we know the God that took care of Moses can take care of us. And we thank you in advance you're going to do exactly that. We pray, our Father, today that you'll have your way. and May Jesus be glorified. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. While we wait here just a moment, while she plays on the piano, is there one here that's not saved and you'd like to come forward and get saved while Viola plays anywhere? You'd like to come and get saved. No better time would you find. Point them in once they don't have to the judge, but you never know when you have to go. Do we have a backslide? I'd like to come back to God. Do we have someone here today you'd like to join this church the way we receive members? Would you come while we wait? Would you like to come?